welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we're having a, a 10 o'clock show as we do on Thursdays uh, with Tom Yamachika of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Today, we're going to talk about limiting tax penalties under the Eighth Amendment. I bet you never heard exactly, or you don't remember exactly what the Eighth Amendment does. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you, Jay. Good to be back. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Eighth Amendment. I mean, it, when you when you think about the Eighth Amendment, uh, you think about people on death row and whether they're going to be uh, you know, given the electric chair or toxic injection or uh, you know, some other means of uh, you know, torture and or death. Uh, but the Eighth Amendment also protects other things like you know, no excessive bail and more to our uh, topic, no excessive fine. Now, uh, the, uh, the, the, the problem uh, that this amendment has, um, you know, ho hopefully addressing uh, has come to light in a few cases uh, that we've, you know, uh, that have been happening across the country. Uh, one of them uh, involves, you know, first of all, the, you know, the basic question uh, of whether this stuff applies to the states at all. Um, there was a case in Indiana uh, where, where, where a person, uh, you know, was, was caught and convicted for, for dealing drugs. Uh, but it, as part of that, uh, you know, the cop seized his SUV uh, uh, valued at forty thousand dollars because it was, you know, being used in the uh, in the offense, and uh, the Indiana basically said, "Okay, this is ours now." Um, and the, the the Indiana lower courts didn't buy that. They said, "Well, that's that's kind of excessive for just uh, you know uh, one conviction, the maximum penalty for which is ten thousand dollars." You're talking about a forty grand SUV there. Um, so uh, no, no, it wasn't a SUV. It was a Land Rover. It was a Land Rover. Uh, Forty thousand uh, dollars that he, you know, bought with his with his own money that he got from insurance policy. Uh, and the Indiana Supreme Court basically says, "Well, you know, come on, guys. Eighth Amendment doesn't apply to the states. It applies to the federal government. It doesn't apply to us. So go ahead and you know take your Land Rover." Uh, and that's when the Supreme Court got him in an opinion by uh, the late, great uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. He said- We know which way she would have gone too without knowing more. <laughs> yeah. And she says, the, the Eighth Amendment does so apply to the state. Yeah. And, um, and furthermore, it really doesn't matter uh, whether you have a criminal proceeding or you have something called a civil forfeiture. Uh, the, the important part of the equation is that the government is exacting punishment uh, and the Eighth Amendment limits the power of government. And so you got to look at, all right, what is this person whose property is being taken uh, done to deserve uh, the forfeiture of his property? And forfeiture or other way by which uh, your property is taken from you. Uh, if that's excessive in uh, in relation to the offense, crime, or whatever it is uh, that is triggering the uh, uh, the taking of this property, uh, then you got a problem, or the government has a problem because it has transgressed the limitations of the Eighth Amendment. Now. Um, this kind of has raised a, a couple of important issues. Now, this, this, by the way, was a case that happened in Indiana just last year. So, well, just for uh, the people who were taking notes, Tom, what, what, what's the name of the case? Can you give us a name? It's of called TIMBS versus Indiana. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, it was decided last year. Uh, Justice Ginsburg and uh, people are just trying. Uh, to make sense of it now, okay. Um, there, there's there's a case in uh, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, 
which is the uh, the court of the federal court of appeals uh, that Hawaii, among other places, reports to. And that case involved the city of LA and its parking fine. Um, now, the, the issue there was uh, you, you, you had the LA County uh, municipal ordinances that provide for parking fines. And what that says is, you know, you, you can park uh, in a metered place, but if you go over the meter and you get caught, uh, you get slapped with a $62, $62 plaster. Okay. Uh, and if you don't pay it in 21 days, uh, you get a late fee of another $62. So, so, so a plaintiff there uh, challenged uh, that as being an excessive fine under the Eighth Amendment. And uh, so went up to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit said, well, you, you know, we don't have any problem uh, with the $62 initial fine, um, but, but really nobody's uh, spoken on the late fee. You know, the, the, uh, uh, the city of LA uh, didn't advance any justification whatsoever as to why uh, a $62 late fee is reasonable. And uh, uh, so there really is no record for us to judge this. So we're gonna send it back to the district court in which, in which they did. Um, so so we, we have the Eighth Amendment's excessive fines clause now being applied to parking fines that are imposed not by the federal government, but by a municipality. Okay, now, um, how do you then apply that to something like we have in our state here? We have, uh, first of all, we have uh, our GE tax, which we all know and love. It provides for penalties. And you know, back in the uh, you know the mid two thousands, we thought we would you know we 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 had a new sheriff in town, uh, and and we we thought ah we're going to beef up these penalties, we're going to make them substantial. Okay, this was in two thousand and nine, and 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 we provided uh, that several of the penalties applicable to the tax code were going to stack, unlike the federal system where they don't stack, ours stack. So if, for example, you don't file, you don't file a, a GE return, you can get written up uh, for failure to file a return, which is a 25% penalty, for negligence, which is another 25%, and for substantial understatement of your tax liability, which is another 20%, total of 70. Uh, I have seen in, in my law practice and you know, talking with other practitioners, I have seen people get written up for 70% penalties. And that was just the start. The following year, and I think we talked about this on the show before, uh, the legislature enacted and, and, and the governor signed the General Excise Tax Protection Act, one of which, uh, the, and it had two, two very harsh provisions, one of which was, if you file your tax return, your annual tax return more than a year late. You lose the benefit of any exemptions uh, or reduced rate or deduction. So if you're a wholesaler, for example, you normally pay tax at a half percent. But if you get caught, caught in the teeth of this provision, you don't file your tax return within a year after it's due, um, you wind up paying four and a half percent, which is nine x. Okay, and and I and I have a case uh, where this penalty has been asserted against the taxpayer who dutifully filed their periodic GE returns on time, the G forty fives, but forgot to file the G forty nine, the annual return. So. Uh, payments were made, the state got its tax, the taxpayer was on the radar, but they're still in the teeth of this penalty. You know, is so they didn't file the summary return at the end of the year, 
which would have reported exactly what was reported earlier. And for, for that transgression, the tax increased from half a percent to four and a half percent, nine X. And that's X. extraordinary, extraordinary time. And that's before the penalties were applied. Yeah. And the penalties would have been on the nine X. No? But on the nine X and interest, the penalty and interest on the nine X and interest is 8%. So part of that is punitive. Okay. Oh, unquestionably punitive. But the other part of it, uh, I don't know how recently that assessment was made, but part of it has to be that the state is in desperate shape financially. The state is trying to raise money. So somebody said to somebody else, you know, you've got to be as aggressive as you can possibly be with these gross excise tax assessments. We need the money. And at the end of the day, that's a political issue. Right. And, and, and there's even more because uh, the other part of the General Excise Tax Protection Act is personal liability. So if you work for a, a corporation but have some say over where, where the corporation's dollars get dispersed uh, and GE tax is, uh, uh, is unpaid or is owing, uh, then they can go after your house. Personally. Personally. That, that really sounds like, um, you know, an extraordinary, uh, what's the word in the Eighth Amendment? Uh, is excessive? Excessive fine. Uh, or unusual. Unusual is the word that comes to mind. Cool and unusual uh, it's, it's excessive, but it's also unusual uh, that, you know, you, you're operating, you're operating as a, uh, as a corporation or an LLC, supposed to have limited liability. This is clearly the liability of the company. Now they're coming after you individually because they say so. And uh, that troubles me right there. Yeah, and, and actually what, what you say kind of brings up another very important point, and that is what happens if you don't have a person, but you have an entity like a corporation being the taxpayer? Okay, do, do the same restrictions apply? Well, uh, Tim's versus Indiana didn't, didn't answer that question because it obviously was an individual. Okay, but a case uh, in Colorado that came out uh, earlier this year said, oh, no, no, uh, the, the Eighth Amendment is a restriction on governmental power. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter who the, uh, you know, who the victim is, but it's a restriction on governmental power, so corporations can get protected by this too. That's just said the Colorado Supreme Court. So, I mean, is that, is that, is that something we should question? No, I think I think it's a very uh, uh, a very good decision. I, I think it's um, in you know very much in line with the philosophy uh, of the Eighth Amendment and of the Bill of Rights in general, which was to limit the power of government. So um, uh, so so I think you know corporations, uh, partnerships, S corporations, LLCs, uh, they are they can all benefit from this analysis. And if you have uh, the, you know, the full weight of the uh, of, of state government bearing down upon you through the tax department, uh, this is maybe a way you can fight back. Yeah, and don't forget that the gross excise tax is completely regressive. I mean, from a societal point of view, you're putting a, a, an inordinate burden on the little guy. So then when you make it tougher still, with excessive fines and penalties, those are imposed on the little guy. Um, that's, very, that's very troubling. But what I get out of the conversation so far is that for a long time, since the Eighth Amendment was written, there hasn't been a lot of litigation or pronouncement by, by the Supreme Court. This Indiana case is important because now, you know, it's, it's on the radar. The Eighth Amendment is on the radar. Number two, I think it shows that it, it wasn't only Indiana. There are a lot of states that forfeited things far in, in value, far in excess of the actual you know, offense or the, the, the fruits of the offense. And so, um, you know, I think it kind of it was running away with itself all over the country. In many states, we had forfeiture statutes um, that were really inordinate. And then, you know, what I get also is that if this applied to Indiana or to California, 
then it applies in a lot of it applies all around the country. The legacy of Ruth Bader Ginsburg on this issue is pretty, pretty important. And it means we have to take take note of the Eighth, Eighth Amendment and we have to straighten up because local governments have been too hard on people, uh, often because they need the money, like in Hawaii. And the last point I get out of the discussion so far is that this happens in Hawaii too. We have excessive fines, penalties, and stacking. And we should take note of that. You know, often the taxpayer has no resources to fight with the ta tax office, and he either has to pay for it or settle it. But he's not going to go to court on a, on a, a, U, a U.S. constitutional issue. <laughs> is, there, is there a similar provision in the state constitution, Tom? I guess there is, but um, you know, it's the same, pretty much the same language, but uh, it really hasn't been spoken to by our Supreme Court yet. Um, but, you know, along, along that, that lines, Jay, uh, you know, I wanted to follow up on one of the points you said. Uh, and, and, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, I think, prophetic because in, in the Tim's opinion, you know, here's what she said. Even absent a political motive, fines may be employed in a measure out of accord with the penal goals of retribution and deterrence, or fines are a source of revenue, while other forms of punishment cost the state money. Don't you think that was a very wise thing to say? Yes. And, and, uh, and I think it's very much in, in line with what happened uh, in 2010 uh, when state government was you know, reeling from what then was the 2008 recession, and they wanted to uh, you know, shore up their, uh, their coffers in, in a manner uh, that wasn't offensive to the general population. So they thought, ah, we're going we're gonna to go after the bad guys. We're, we're, we're going to go after the scofflaw. Uh, we're going to make it life really tough on them. So this is what they came up with. And it was like one draconian thing after another. Well, you can say draconian on that, but let, let me offer a thought. So let's, let's uh, say that there were tons of scofflaws in, in LA. Nobody was paying parking tickets, nobody. They stick them in the glove compartment by the, by the dozens and never get around to it. And, and, the, and the state, the city, LA didn't have the resources to go chase all those $62 parking tickets. They, you know, it's, it was not an economic experience for them to try to chase. So how in the world do you make an efficient model of collection? Well, you, you, you discourage people from putting them in the glove compartment and you make it clear to them that there's something more here. And unless they pay, they're gonna suffer. And you know, there's a certain, I, you know, I think this is all guided by what does the average person think is fair and unfair, excessive or unusual, and so forth. And you know, if I'm an ordinary person and I see all these people with glove, full glove compartments, I say, you know, we gotta we gotta find a way to have them pay. It's unfair. You know, if the ticket was wrong, let them argue with it. But if the ticket was right, let them pay it. And and if um, and if they don't pay it, we gotta find a way to make them pay it. It's not unreasonable, is it? Of course not. Um, and, and I think that's probably, you know, part of what motivated the, the lawmakers there and here uh, to pass this kind of legislation. Um, I, I think, you know, in 2010, there was a lot of discussion of, well, geez, there are too many, uh, you know, corporations and businesses that are really uh, thumbing their nose at the general excise tax and not... Uh, and, and, and basically disobeying the requirements of the law. So, so we got to make them, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to impress upon the public uh, that we're serious about this stuff. And, uh, you know, we, we can do this by making, an ex you know, making some examples uh, of people and, and really beat them up. Yeah, but, you know, at the end of the day, maybe the parking should be free. Uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> you know, find find other ways to raise money. I mean, we're in a crisis of social compact uh, where people don't like the government. They really don't. And they live their whole lives not caring about the government, not wanting to help the government, not, not being sympathetic to the problems of the government, criticizing the government for everything. 
uh, bottom line is the government is us and we are the government. Uh, a better society is when everybody likes what the government does. So if you do excessive fines and penalties, you're really going to you know, lose a supporter, not political supporter, but a citizen supporter. And he is going to or she is going to carry around enmity for the rest of his life, maybe over a, a, what he considers or she considers a an unfair maneuver by government. And I think the government always has to take that. When you have this us and them kind of mentality, we are going to punish. We are going to forfeit. We are going to make them suffer. Um, you know, then, then you, you lose the social compact. I, I, so it's a, I know it's a it's a it's a 50,000 foot way of looking at it. Um, but I think that government ought to be very conscious of how people feel about it. And when you're yeah. giving out tens of thousands of tickets every day, um, you're making tens of thousands of enemies every day. Is that the right thing? Well, you're, you're I think, very much correct in that the government is us. And there's a great need for uh, us to uh, engender trust in the government that we have. Uh, if if we can't trust our government when the government's us, then who can we trust, right? Um, and the way government can do this is by, uh, you know, doing things that are fair. Uh, you know, they may be severe, uh, but you, but if it, it, but if they're understandable, um, then you know, you as a citizen, you and I as citizens can get behind it. Uh, if it's not understandable, if it's not reasonable, if it if it really shocks our conscience. Uh, we're, we're thinking, geez, you know, uh, wh what the heck are these clowns in power doing to us? Uh, and, it, and it makes us all fearful because, you know, what happens, uh, you know, to, to Joe Q public one day can happen to me the next day. Yeah. And, and if you, you know, want to be firm, fair, and also consistent, universal. And I think one of the things that happened, do you remember there was a fellow who, uh, he was a political animal in Hawaii and, uh, and he could fix a ticket. He was somehow attached to, you know, the political party or the legislature or something. I, I forget his name. And um, if, you, if you knew him or knew somebody around him, you'd call him up, he could, he could fix the ticket. And, and what, what troubles me about excessive fines, excessive forfeitures, excessive penalties, is that if it's excessive, it's made for corruption. It's made for inconsistent enforcement. It's made, it's made for, for arbitrariness. Corruption, say, say it again. It's made for arbitrariness in its application. Yeah. You know, you, you, you really, you know, if you, if you go out and really bludgeon somebody, uh, the question then becomes, well, why are you bludgeoning this guy over, you know, uh, over somebody else uh, or this, these thousands of somebody else who did the same thing or, or worse? I mean, why, why are you beating up my guy who's only, who's only filed uh, G45s and no G49s when, when you're letting, you know, A, B, and C go and they haven't filed any return? Or paid any tax. Or paid any tax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have to be smart about it. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid we haven't. And that's why the Tax Foundation is so important to take a look at these things and to analyze them from a public policy point of view. And um, I'm not sure... That, that you know, it's it's the right time to make that kind of analysis right now when we're in, you know, desperate straits for next session and fiscal policy. I mean, somebody said the other day we could expect to have a 1.2 billion dollar shortfall deficit in this state next year. Wow, uh, how I mean, are we going to cover yeah, that? 2.4. It's already there. Yeah. It's not. You know, can we expect? It's already here. If you if you you know. Uh, uh, compare uh, the, the Council on Revenues revenue projections with the general fund budget. Okay, there's a there's a 2.4 billion dollar difference, and so uh, that that that's why uh, you know the current administration is going in, into panic mode. Uh, you know, with you know talk of uh, forfeitures and, and not forfeitures but furloughs, uh, layoffs, and uh, you know, demanding that agencies shrink their budget by another 20% after the, the furloughs and layoffs. Yeah, so what you, you know, okay, so that's one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is to try to squeeze the taxpayer. Um, it, now it's hard to raise income tax. It's hard to raise gross excise tax. It's very politically unpopular. It's, it's a kiss of death politically. 
So what do you do? You find these little mm, parking ticket kinds of things, you know, and you you raise up all boats and you you find ways to squeeze the taxpayer. I think we can expect more of this, Tom. Yeah, no, I, I think there will definitely be be tax increase proposals in the legislature. One of the things you got to watch out for is that, you know, when you look at all the taxes that we collect, there are basically two big ones and everything else combined is equal to one of the other two. Okay, the two, the two big ones are one, the GE tax, and two, the individual income tax, not the corporate tax, but the individual income tax. Why? Because of the wage earners who pay uh, withholding. If uh, if you want to make changes in you know other kinds of taxes, yeah, you, you get a few million here, a few million there, but you're not going to get you know a billion dollars or two billion dollars, which is what you need. So, yeah. uh, what what you know what are lawmakers going to do? Well, I, I don't think they can furlough enough people to really make a big difference. And by the way, furloughing is also politically unpopular. And you have government workers uh, unions that would scream and shout about it. Well, they're doing so, that now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> they're doing that now and, and it'll be worse later. Everything will be worse later. So what does the government do? I mean, it's, it's hard to raise taxes. It's hard to furlough. Um, I guess you, you got to cut services in some way. Um, I, I don't see a, an easy option. Where, where do you think there's give here so as to get back to a, uh, you know, a balanced budget, which is supposed well, to be the requirement? I, I, think, I think one of the things that the government's got to do is, is just to figure out where the core services are and then figure out what's, uh, you know, nice to have as opposed to we really need this and start getting rid of the nice to haves. You know, realistically speaking, that's what you've got to do. Yeah. And, and that and that really has to be done on a rational basis, rather than on a political basis, because, you know, whatever happens in government in this state and most others is going to be a function of lobbyists and political pressure from constituents and, and, and cacophony pressure from all sides and politicians these days, especially in this crisis that they have to they have to uh, not accept that. They have, to, they have to say, no, we're going to do this on a completely rational basis. We think we should call Tom Yamachika up and ask his advice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think in, in those kinds of times like now, uh, we should be glad that we have, you know, fundamental protections like the Bill of Rights to protect us. I think we, yeah. It was, it was a fun show, Jay. Yeah, including including the uh, the Eighth Amendment. So the Bill of Rights and the... the it's one of the Bill of Rights. And we forget, but now maybe we should remember. So before we go, Tom, I just have to tell you one short story I made my mind up to tell you about. When I was uh, in the service, I was a legal officer in the service. And uh, one case uh, crossed my desk um, about a fellow who uh, went, went AWOL. And, and uh, the military judge who sat on that case was a, a strong Catholic. Um, and he was a very liberal fellow, uh, like he went on freedom rides in the South. That's the kind of fellow he was. And uh, he decided that he was going to make, um, make a difference here. So instead of putting this, this uh, young man in the brig, uh, he gave him two weeks in St. Mary's Orphanage, uh, <laughs> which, which was in that Coast Guard district. And um, he made him swab the floors in the orphanage for two weeks. Okay. Okay, and the fellow had a crafty lawyer step in and he said, no, 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 you can't make me swab the floors in St. Mary's orphanage because of the Eighth Amendment. That's unusual. It isn't cruel, um, it isn't excessive, it's unusual. And he made his, he made his um, appeal on that basis. And can you guess the result? Um. That the, 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 the judge said, okay, uh, you don't want to do this? You go right to the brig. And That's exactly right. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> I, I thought you'd enjoy that story. So the word unusual has all kinds of, you know, <laughs> strange implications. <laughs>
Well, thank you, Tom. Great to talk with you as always. I look forward to our next discussion. Take care, be well. Take care. Aloha. <laughs>